Good morning. You must be wondering why I'm here and not there. Yes? Well, I've announced, all, I think, already that for another four weeks, I'm off. So this week, 3rd, 10th, and 17th. From 10th to 17th, I'm away on a holiday, but right now I'm preparing for my exam. And Scott, Scott Alexander Marshall, he's helping me. Well, he's in, been helping me for last two years, I would say, because Scott uh, was my, my supervisor when I was doing my probation under Church of Scotland, and I was at PKW Church, which was uh, combined with three or four churches actually linked together. Um, Winchborough, King's Cable, Bridge End, Phillipston, Abercorn uh, churches, and Scott was looking after. Well, I would like to introduce you. My, my supervisor actually was a very good friend of mine, to be honest. Um, when I started my provision, I always called Scott Buster. And that's what the Indian tradition is. And one day we had a funeral, after that we had tea, and then we were walking uh, back, and Scott said, Harrison, don't call me pastor. That's my rank, but you can call me Scott. So Scott is a very humble, very humble, humble man, and I have only good things to say about him. So I would like to introduce uh, uh, Scott, and so as I already said, his name is Scott Alexander Marshall. Uh, Scott born in East Kilbride, well, towards the Glasgow side, and then he lived there for around 10 years, and then he moved to Livingston, when it was a new town, and then Bathgate. So he studied in Bathgate Academy, and then his wife is Suzanne, she's working right now. Well, Scott is actually retired after 37 years of his ministry. Um, can we clap for that? 37 years is just quite a long time to, to work. And he spent 23 years in the church I've just mentioned, in Winchborough. Staying in one church for, 30, uh, for 23 years is such a brave react, I would say. And thanks to people, but thanks to Scott that he, can, he stayed in that church for all those years. But before that, he was a community minister in Edinburgh before he joined Church of Scotland. His wife, Suzanne, as I said, she's still working. Uh, and Scott got one daughter called Laura. And um, she already have one son who is Riley, 10 years old. And now she's expecting another one, so <laughs> another boy in March. So they're very happy, very, very happy. Now Scott moved back to uh, Bathgate, which was actually my town where I was living. And he's almost my neighbor there. And he's enjoying his retirement. So once again, Scott, thank you very much. And you're welcome to Castells Parish Church. We have a lovely bunch of people. Uh, they never throw stones or anything, or tomatoes, whenever I preach something wrong. <laughs> so very good people, I would say. But um, I'm very glad that you're here and we are sharing the pulpit. So thank you so much. I will just go upstairs and do the techie thing because we are doing something new there. And over to you, Scott. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the beauty of being retired is, if you don't like what I do this Sunday, I don't need to come back. So, <laughs> the, fr the freedom, the freedom that gives you. Uh, when Harrison applied for the congregations up here, we came for a drive, my wife and I, one Sunday afternoon, and I looked at the gutters, because you can tell a lot about a church from the gutters. Um, if it's well cared for, and what you find inside, uh, equally as beautiful. So, um, it's 12 weeks since I've conducted a Sunday morning service, so I might be a bit rusty, but uh, we'll take a moment of quiet to gather our thoughts for worship. Be strong and of good courage. Be not fearful or dismayed, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. We begin our worship with the hymn for the beauty of the earth.
our first prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come together in this place to sing hymns which others have written, to hear your word which has been handed down to us, to have your spirit prompt our thoughts and imaginations. We've come to have our hearts and lives blessed by you so that we may feel close to you and closer to each other. We know what the psalmist says, that you promise peace to your people and protect them from their mistakes. In a world where there is terror and war and violence and fear, we pray that we would at least find a peace of mind in trusting ourselves to you. We pray that we would find a peace of mind in the decisions and choices we have made in our lives, especially in the hard choices that we have made. We pray that you would give us peace in our hearts and make us content with good and simple blessings. The roof over our heads, the food on our table, the love of family and the companionship of friends, for the beauty of the natural world around us for the revelation of Christ and the freedom and the opportunity to worship. We thank you for the salvation and freedom from the power of death that we find in you. We thank you that in Christ we have found a love and a faithfulness which is deeper and stronger than we can find in anyone else. So we pray that we would be worthy to love and be faithful to you, our God. We pray that you would keep us right with you. We thank you that through all of life's changes, you are present. When the world and its pressures overwhelm us, we pray that you would carry us through. When we find struggles hard to face, you do not reject us, but remain open to us. We trust that your love for us is beyond limit. Your care and concern and compassion reach out to us in our times of deepest need. So this day, we come to worship you, our God. When we fail you, speak to us again with your words of forgiveness and assurance. When we feel lost and isolated and alone, help us to find the trust in you that renews our strength. And when we wrong others through our words and our attitudes and our actions, help us to take the initiative in seeking forgiveness and reconciliation so that we with others may live with a peace of mind and a contentment of heart. Hear us now as we unite together to say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Um, As Harrison's already uh, mentioned, I have recently retired. So you can do the arithmetic and uh, calculate. I'm in my mid-60s. I'm of the generation that, as a child... I recall it was black and white television and there was a limited choice of channels in the era where people rented a television rather than actually owned one. Children's TV over 60 years ago was limited. I have memories of Andy Pandy and the wooden tops. I have memories of Bill and Ben and the flower pot men. And I guess back then children's television programs were really puppet theatre with a narrator. narrator. Different little worlds created for children to inhabit. Do any of you remember Bill and Ben, the flower pot men? Those two characters, two other characters, Reed, I think, and the gardener. And I have a memory, I'm not sure if it's correct, that all the fun and activity had to come quickly to an end when they heard the footsteps of the gardener. Bill and Ben and Little Weed lived in a secret world in the Gardner. The Gardner didn't know half 
of what was going on. Before retiring, I had a massive garden at the back of the manse, about equivalent about four tennis courts, and I had I had a big hose as well, but I had a green watering can. Um, and also had a, a red watering can. Why do gardeners have a different colour code for their watering cans? My green can was for water, my red was for weed killing. My green watering can brought life-giving moisture to keep the plants alive and thriving. The red watering can brought the weed killer and the poison. It brings an end to life in the plant. So weed wouldn't have lasted too long with a sprinkling of weed killer from that red can. And of course, gardeners nowadays use weed killers that are already um, mixed and they spray on. Modern weed day killers understand work with the weed, the weed killer being absorbed into the leaves and then into the plant and down into the roots. Modern weed killers destroy the roots rather than poison the soil. Many weeds, in my experience, have had very long roots. But this idea of having roots is something we talk about as humans. To have roots, what does that mean? It could mean to have a place where we belong and where we live and where we grow up. For religious people, it can mean to be rooted in faith, to have a sense of security, a strength and a foundation in our faith. And having roots, putting down roots in a place you make your home, is a good and a positive thing. Valuing our roots should be a cause of celebration. And also creating space for others to put down roots in our communities and churches is surely always a good thing. In Ephesians, it talks about being rooted in love. Being rooted in love is different from being rooted in fear. Being rooted in love is different from being rooted in hate. Being rooted in love is a different way to live. Being rooted in love leads to a power within to strengthen our lives. In our reading from the book of Esther, we will hear the story of someone who's been uprooted and living in exile, hiding her Jewish roots. Amen. So our first reading is part of Esther, uh, reading from chapter 3 at verse 13 into chapter 4. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadels of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. When Mordecai learned of all this, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every pro province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloths and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to, her, to attend to her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the extra exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. 
He also gave him a copy of the text of the Edict for the Anna Annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go to the king's presence, to beg for mercy, and plead with him for her people. Arthur went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman to approach the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king was in danger that they be put to death unless the king extends to the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai. He sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's household, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows about what you have come and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And then we read from Mark chapter 9, reading from verse 33. Whoever is not against us is for us. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around the neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go to hell, where the fire never gives out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Amen. May God give us understanding of his word. We now continue our worship with the hymn 393, We Turn to God.
Uh, I'm not sure how often the story of Esther is told to children in the Sunday school setting. There are some challenging parts to that story. And some scholars suggest that one way to interpret the story is to recognize it as satire, where humor, irony, exaggeration, and ridicule are used to expose and criticize people who are in authority. In the story of Esther, the king is an angry and huffy man who can't make decisions. The queen won't obey him, so he instructs all other women in the kingdom to obey their husbands. The king chooses a new queen by using something akin to Miss Persia beauty pageant, and the contestants get six months beauty treatment, and a set of gallows is built 75 feet high. Yes, there may be a good bit of satire in that story. And of course, there's some uncomfortable issues for the modern leader, Esther Con Concubine, an exploited sexual possession. The Jews get a two-day free pass to kill those who would have killed them. But the story is there in the Bible for us to wrestle with and learn from. The scholars tell us that the book of Esther is unusual in the Bible for a few reasons. There's no mention of Jerusalem, the law, or the prophets. There's no mention of the promised land or the exile. There's no prayers or miracles. The nearest you come to a pious act is fasting. And God doesn't get a mention in the story of Esther. You may recall the story and the characters. Esther's an orphan. She's part of a religious minority as a Jew living in Persia. She's looked after by her uncle Mordecai, who's an advisor in the royal court, and she ends up living in the king's harem. And as I said, we would describe that now as an exploited slave. Esther has to hide her Jewish identity. She has to live her life in the everyday way and customs of Persia, the dominant culture. Esther's got to conceal her identity at the heart of power in the royal court of Susa until she finds favor with the king. Mordecai uncovers a plot. He saves the king from being assassinated. And there are others who wish the king's ear and wish to influence the king. Haman is the baddie in the story, and he has persuaded the king to decree that all Jews should be killed. And Haman has a 75-foot set of gallows built just for Mordecai. So in all that scheming and plotting, Esther is on the fringe of power. And essentially, she's got to walk a tightrope. And she becomes an advocate to save her people. Esther is a Jewish woman at the Persian court. And like all other exiles, she has to make careful judgments on how to live and navigate living in a different culture. Then there comes the crux point. She has to make a choice. Does she keep her head down and enjoy her royal privilege? Or does she stand out? and stand up for her people. Mordecai, her uncle, reminds her she is in a position of influence and opportunity for such a time as this. When I was reading the story of Esther again, I couldn't help but think of the women in Afghanistan who over the last 20 years have lived with fuller opportunities and education and employment in public and political service. But with the Taliban in the dominance, these opportunities and freedoms have been denied. Some brave Afghan women have protested in their communities. And one academic in the United States says this as she watches the events in her home country. Identity is sacred, heritage is holy, and culture is life. These brave Afghan women are fighting a war of self-preservation on their home soil. Identity is sacred, heritage is holy, and culture is life. I think that sums up the constraints of Esther's existence. She's denied her identity, her heritage, and her culture as an exile in a foreign land. But these Afghan women are denied their identity, heritage, and culture in their own land. I wonder if in future years some of these brave Afghan women's protests will be recognized and their protests seen as significant as being for such a time as this when they bravely protested. 
the prospects and success for women in Afghanistan is not good. But back to the story of Esther, by the end of the book, the tables are turned and things are turned upside down. The powerful are brought low, the plot of the evil Haman to destroy the Jews is overturned, and it's he himself that hangs in the gallows that was created for Mordecai. The tables are turned in that the Jews are not destroyed, rather they preserve themselves by destroying their enemies. So there's a lot of drama in the story of Esther. She's living as a religious minority, careful and wise in the judgments she makes. She's got to decide when to reveal her religious identity, but in the end, claiming her Jewish identity leads to deliverance. And of course, Esther takes great personal risk. While the powerful people and the evil people appear to be in control, there is an unseen hand at work, even if God is not mentioned. God doesn't get mentioned, but we must assume that through Mordecai and Esther, he is at work. Perhaps we might even say that through the deposed Queen Vashti, God was at work. If Queen Vashti hadn't stood her ground and refused the king, if she hadn't done that, Esther wouldn't have become the queen. So perhaps part of the message of the story of Esther is that no matter how bad things may be, God is still at work through his people. And sometimes it just takes one or two people to make a difference. Sometimes it takes a crafty understanding of issues and people to actually influence change. So perhaps we can see parallels for us. Christians can feel like a minority in a dominant culture. Our Christian identity can be challenged by other outlooks. Britain first, employee first, consumer first. Lots of other claims on our time and attention and allegiance some writers express the concern that Christian faith can too easily be childish and immature, and so prevents us from using our God-given power and responsibility to challenge and change things that are out of step with God's kingdom. However, through people of faith, people who are pure in heart, who focus on God and on others, God is indeed present, defying, standing up against the forces of evil and oppression. So perhaps when we look at Esther and Mordecai, we do indeed get a glimpse of God. They make a difference. They give us a glimpse of God. Just as in Christ, we get more of a glimpse of God. Christ turns everything upside down. The God who casts down the mighty and lifts up the poor. This is the God whom Christ welcomes the sinners and sits at the table with them while the Pharisees stand outside and mutter. This is the God whom Christ places the prostitutes and the outcasts at the head of the queue of the heavenly banquet and sends the squeaky clean holy people to the back. And such role reversal is God's type of guest list and seating plan. We live in a secular age, but as Christians, we meet for worship. We celebrate the sacraments at other times to reinforce our identity and our tradition. These Christians meet in a time when it may appear that God has been written out of the world story. But we can glimpse this God in the beauty of the natural world around us. We can glimpse this God wherever evil and injustice is undone. And the tables are turned and people find liberty and hope. And we glimpse this God in the response and actions of human beings who do God's work in simple everyday acts of kindness. But to finish one final thought, the story of Esther is about crisis and the time, and the time being short. The story of Esther is about those who have limited power, seizing the agenda and influencing those with power to change direction and choose a different course of action. The story of Esther is standing up for principles. There's a quote that says, a principle isn't a principle until it costs you. Esther knew what was at stake by trying to influence the king, by trying to influence those in power. 
if I die, I die. The crisis in the Esther story is the destruction of the Jewish people. But perhaps we might reflect on the story of Esther in the light of the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow. The crisis we're slow and late in recognizing is the destruction of the planet, the destruction of habitats and species, and the destruction of humankind. Are they not all God's people, regardless of identity, tradition, culture, or faith? It would seem that time is running out for us to respond to climate change, climate crisis, and climate injustice. I heard the professor from Cambridge, Sir David King, chair of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, interviewed the other night on the television. He talked of the reality of ice melting on land around the world, leading to a rise in sea levels of 20 meters. I was busy imagining the impact of a 20 meter rise in sea level at South Queens Ferry of North Berwick. It's unthinkable. And we know that in parts of the world already, they face devastation of land lost to drought and land lost to rising water levels. And some of our contemporary prophets would say the church, together with other faith communities, and along with anyone else who cares, needs to respond in prayer and action. Mordecai warns Esther that because she lived in the royal palace, she's not safe or protected. We who live in a developed country in Europe are not safe or protected or immune to the global climate challenges and crisis. For such a time as this, we need to pray and act with justified craftiness, even if we feel powerless. Amen. Now our prayer for others, let us pray. In worship together, we are conscious that we are part of a family of faith. We know Jesus prayed for unity, not just for his followers, but for the whole world. Unity between individuals and nations, between creeds and cultures. We pray for harmony and peace for every part of our troubled and divided world. We pray for justice in places where people are exploited. We pray for just trust and courage. Wherever fear fuels violence. We pray for our broken world that you would give power to carry out sacrificial service to help repair and renew our broken world. We pray for places we know that are scarred by violence and conflict, where sectarian tension or ethnic unrest goes beyond words of hate to war and terror and genocide. In this broken world, we pray for hope and peace built on justice. We pray for those who are victims of intolerance and prejudice, for those who have to endure hatred and persecution, and for those whose lives are blighted by religious extremism or political ideology. In this broken world, may those who have power recognize that all humankind is made in the image of God. We pray for those who use words to incite and inflame divisions who undermine and are destructive. May their motives be exposed in the light of truth. We pray that your spirit would stir the conscience of those who find it easy to hate rather than to love and care. In this broken world, we pray for the brokenhearted who have lost a loved one. We pray for those who grieve. And we pray for the churches and Christians throughout the world who have little, but whose faith is great and challenges our own. In a broken world, may we look for hope and inspiration and the people and the places who lean on you and trust and obey you. And for those who continue in faith against the odds, we take strength from their example and their witness. And we pray for the COP26 summit in Glasgow, for world leaders and activists. We pray that the voices of indigenous communities may be heard and heeded. 
as we learn how to live in harmony with nature. We pray for a rapid and just transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And we pray for a new deal for climate justice, where the right thing is done in the right way. May we have a sense that how we live today and the choices we make impact others now and impact generations yet to be born. In a moment of quiet, we bring to you the people and the places and the concerns which we hold close to our hearts. Hear all our prayers, whether spoken aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Uh, we now sing the hymn 533, Will You Come and Follow Me? hope go forth celebrating love go forth to be transformed people that god calls us to be go forth to transform the world in times of prosperity and in times of the disbelief hostility fear and rejection go forth with the knowledge that you're always surrounded by the presence of our steadfast loving god our rock and our redeemer may we rest secure in god's love and be steadfast in this time. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and all who we love, both now and forever. <laughs> 